KCRW's car donation program is sponsored by local Kia dealers. Power meets purpose in the all-new Kia Sportage X-Pro, a vehicle with a mission and multi-terrain all-wheel drive. It'll stop everyone in their tracks while blazing its own. More info at Kia.com. Hi, this is Robert Shear with another edition of Shear Intelligence, where the intelligence comes from my guest. In this case, Oliver Stone, and I'm going to say on the subject I want to talk about, Vladimir Putin, Russia, and what's going on with the Ukraine, what's going on with the world, I'm going to you know, say it right here. I think Oliver Stone has a viewpoint about Putin, who knows about Putin, In a way, I don't know if there's anybody else I could be calling it right now. He did the Putin interviews for Showtime. I thought it was an incredible documentary. The New York Times, which, you know, uh, got a very angry Russian emigre to attack it, Masha Gessen. But I have looked at this thing over and over, and I think it's an incredible insight into another government leader that we have to do business with. And Oliver did a dozen interviews over a two-year period with Putin. I found it a candid look, and I just want to praise it as, as, as a work of journalism, which obviously the New York Times didn't do. But whether we like Putin or hate Putin, we got to figure out what he's doing now. And with the recent declaration between Z, the Chinese leader, and this Russian leader, that they have a common view of the Western alliance being really basically another way of describing U.S. hegemony, using NATO to really push people around uh, and that they have a, now an agreement to withstand it, it means you just can't easily um, say you're going to just you know cut people off economically and so forth. That represents a pretty powerful coalition. So let me just begin with that. You know, what the hell is going on? You're a guy who fought communism in Vietnam. You got the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, everything else. We would have thought this many years later, we still wouldn't be screwing around with some kind of Cold War scenario, but we are. (laughs) Yeah. Well, Bob, I thank you for your comments and very nice of you. Uh, You you actually are one of the few people in the United States who looked at the Putin interviews and and looked at it as opposed to criticize it without seeing it, which is what often happened. So uh, I know I know you a long time, and I think you and I pretty much agree on the United States' uh, position in the world and what's going on. So I'm going to take it from there and just what tell you what I think is going on right now. No one really knows what's going on in the actual sense of being in Russia's mind. But I do think from the beginning, this has been a defensive maneuver from the Russian side. The United States and its allies in NATO have been provoking uh, Russia for since two years now on you, actually three years over the Ukraine, more. I mean, they started this in 2014, but uh, it's, it's, they've been using Ukraine as bait, as, as, a, as, a, um, tar- as a temperature taker of that region. And now we've reached this place where they have threatened the Soviet, the Russians, so much that they had to react because I don't think Putin could have stayed in office if he had not reacted. So this is a very, it's just a game that's somewhat like the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. Uh, Russia is concerned, very tense, and the the United States and its allies don't seem to be listening to its concern, don't seem to care about its, its concern about NATO and uh, specifically Ukraine, but there's, it's, it's, it's not just Ukraine. It's also the Baltic. It's the, it's the constant war exercises on the Baltic region. It's the pressure from uh, uh, Europe. It's the uh, United States in, in the air. We send our bombers close to the border with nukes on them. So we're constantly provoking them going into their territory. If, if we can think of it as as Canada and the United States, if Canada were doing that and sending uh, sending uh, warnings to us like this, we would be freaking out. 
uh, I would think Canada is somewhat like the Ukraine. Ukraine is to the Soviet, to the Russians, like Canada is to the United States. Uh, in other words, yeah, go ahead. Well, let me let me just push this a little bit because I say in the intro, you actually talk to Putin, and and you know. Uh, this guy has been demonized because, uh, you know, if you go back to Orwell, uh, 1984, uh, he, his great fear that he discussed was the need of the new empire, whatever it was, and America fits the bill now, uh, with its 800 bases to constantly have an enemy. And the whole contradiction with Russia, at least with China, which we get along with a lot better than we do with Russia because we need them. China took us through the pandemic. China made Jeff Bezos the richest man in the world because most of the goods that we're consuming to get through are from China. So whether they're communists or not communists, they're very good capitalists, and we need China. And China has 1.4 billion people. Russia has 140 million people. It's got a military. It's got a big land mass. And the, but the big contradiction, whereas at least the Chinese still have a communist party in power, Vladimir Putin was picked by the United States. He was picked by Yeltsin, who was the guy that the United States liked more than Gorbachev. Uh, and uh, uh, Putin was brought into power, basically, because Yeltsin was a hopeless drunk, and Putin at least represented sobriety and some kind of conservative uh, Russian Orthodox nationalism, clearly had broken with any communist past. So the inconvenience here is we are demonizing a guy who got elected by defeating what, the remnants of the old Russian communist system. And yet it doesn't matter. We're, logic doesn't matter. Facts don't matter. We need an enemy. That's the way I see it. And Putin is the enemy. So tell us about this enemy, because he's clearly not a communist ideologue. He clearly doesn't quote Marx uh, extensively. And he's actually a conservative, what, at best, a Peter the Great czar type figure. And you've met him. I mean, it's no small thing. I mean, it's very interesting to dismiss someone of your worldwide experience. You've interviewed a lot of people. You've seen war. You've seen the world. And yet somehow your two years of trying to figure out Putin and your dozen interviews, which I think is a real important reservoir of information, gets ignored. And all these people in journalism and everywhere, they're talking about Putin, 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 as if he's Stalin or something. I know. I know. I, it's, it's nutty. It's nutty is yeah. what it is. And it's scary. Uh, last, last week, I was looking at the American news, and I could not believe how bloodthirsty the journalists were. They, CNN and Fox both were demanding, almost demanding our leaders to, to take on, to get tough with the Russians because we have taken enough gaff from them, as if Putin had pushed all our buttons, as if he was the aggressive one. We act in, I saw young women with no experience of life, these are in their, in their 30s, uh, talking about the need to really go after Russia. And then they would cut to some general in civilian clothes who's, or some guy from, the, from a think tank who's going to tell them what they want to hear. I, ne I didn't see one person on television who was talking for peace. Uh, talking to understand Russia. I really didn't. And I, that is very, as you say, these people like Masha Giesen, who, you know, is to the right uh, on, on most things Russian, are, are telling us from the, what the Russian point of view is, but that it's just not true. The Russian point of view has always been consistent, and Mr. Putin has always been consistent in what he says. Uh, and he says basically the argument is, okay, well, first of all, I wouldn't say that he got into power because of us. I do think that Yeltsin who was not as drunk and hopeless as you think, but I do think Yeltsin chose him. But the United States came down on Putin after his speech in Munich in 2007, when he said there has to be a line. And the Yeah, but that was seven years after he got elected with our blessing and he defeated the Communist Party candidate. He was the, the anti-communist when he got elected. Absolutely, and he does have no, he has no fondness for the old empire as many of these... Russia th thinkers say it's it's nonsense. He has no desire to return to that world. He is looking for security. Security is the mother word here. He's, he's a son of Russia. The Russian people demand security. They do not want to be th all the time threatened 
by a Western power that is telling them you have to do this and you have to do that. But NATO is also a huge threat because we've seen NATO expand since 1999 by 13 countries. And now there's talk, of course, with Ukraine joining NATO and all that stuff. But uh, the truth is NATO is seen by the Russian people as an enemy. They, they bombed Yugoslavia in the 1990s, if you remember. They attacked Libya. Uh, NATO has turned from a defensive organization into a very aggressive organization. They were in Iraq. We've seen their activities in Afghanistan. NATO continues to be an arm of the United States to bring offensive operations. And this is, a, it's not working. And what Putin is saying in general is lay off, back away. You cannot run war exercises all the time on our borders. You cannot talk this language of calling us the aggressor. That's what's very interesting to me is the United States media always say, every day I see it in the newspaper or this or that, you know, the Russian invasion of, the coming Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now this, this is outrageous because First of all, we have to, they have no proof that Russia intends to invade Ukraine. I doubt that. They would. I think Russia is concerned only with the Donbass region. The Donbass region being the, the eastern sector uh, where the Russian-speaking people are threatened by the Ukrainian government. Why? Because we saw back in 2014, they were killing them. There was quite a bit of murder going on. And they were, did not want to, the, the Ukrainian government did not want to recognize the historic autonomy of the eastern Ukraine, of the people who speak Russian. In fact, Russian language was, was banned in Ukraine, if you remember correctly. And there's been a general, strong, almost nationalistic uh, attack on Russia from, from those years. And we know about the, the, ex, uh, the old uh, Nazis the, the Nazis from World War II, they have, their inheritors are in Ukraine. There's quite a few fascist people there who are working and putting pressure on the government to attack Donbass. We saw what happened, uh, if you remember correctly, in, uh, uh, in o Odessa, they, when the, the, uh, the Russian-speaking natives were surrounded in a building and the, 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 uh, the Ukrainian nationalists burned them alive. That was a horrible moment, and was it 20, 30 dead? And it was shocking to the, uh, to, to the world and gave us the intention, showed us the intention of the Ukrainian government. Well, you know, the real issue here, and it's interesting, I want to talk about one of my favorite Oliver Stone movies, which doesn't get the respect. I mean, you've won all these Academy Awards, uh, I mean, three, I think, and there were all sorts of honors. But I liked your movie on Alexander. And what I liked about it, and what I like about the whole question of Alexander really goes to a, the central tension in human history. Uh, what is the role of... of partisanship of patriotism of nationalism and 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 something has happened it was interesting in the dispute you know aristotle was Ale of course you know alexander's teacher and then advisor and aristotle betrayed really the pursuit of ethics when he advised alexander uh to to be an imperialist really and and in regard to the persians he said you know, treat the Greeks, all of the Greek cities and so forth, as your family, as your friends, but treat the non-Greeks, that was the Persians then, basically, uh, as beasts and vegetables. Yeah. And, and they have no rights. And Alexander, because he was out there, the way Oliver Stone was out there, but you were a grunt, and he was leading it, and you were in Vietnam, and you saw the humanity of the Vietnamese. My understanding is Alexander said, hey, these are people. They got brains. Uh, maybe they could cooperate with us and so forth. It was an interesting moment. The U.S. is kind of in that position. We, as a culture, only accept our own legitimacy, our own nationalism, but we don't call it nationalism. We call it internationalism. And anybody else in the world 
who has some nationalist concerns, beginning with the Chinese and Russians, but it extends to anyone else. Their nationalism is always threatening, is always illegitimate. And to my mind, that's the issue here. Not to, I don't want to tear down Ukrainian nationalism, and I don't want to overly boost Russian nationalism. But you have, as you point out in Ukraine, you have people who there who think that they are identified with Russia, and you have to worry about what happens to them. And you have a clash of nationalisms. And the basic U.S. position is that we are not nationalists. Everything we believe in is universal. It's the definition of freedom and the good life. And anybody who disagrees, and that's really what that Chinese-Russian statement was all about, these two countries, which, by the way, are closer now than they were under communism. There was a Sino-Soviet dispute when they were both ostensibly communist. But in their declaration last week of their common concern about the Western NATO-led alliance, they're saying that this hegemonic, hegemonic power of the United States using NATO is an enormous threat. And I think that's something people don't want to address. What's they think, oh, no, we're just pursuing human rights, which is nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. What, one thing that comes through in the interviews with Mr. Putin, where he constantly refers to sovereignty, the sovereignty of Russia, the sovereignty of any country. It's very important to the Russian nation. Uh, they have interests. They have national interests. Everyone is allowed to have their national interests. We have never recognized their interests. Uh, on the contrary, we've done our best to spoil their interests with our sanctions and with our encouragement of the coup and our financing of the coup in Ukraine. We tried to do the same thing in Georgia, and they fought a small war against the Georgians. And they also, we tried to do it like, repeatedly, possibly even in Kazakhstan in recently. The United States is always looking to cause tension. That is the key. Tension, color revolution, any of these things raise the, the, the temperature and make it possible for a coup or a, a regime change, which is the objective of people like Victoria Nuland, who's at the Under Secretary Department of State. So I think that, you, you know, I don't even, we don't recognize it. And we go and we play dirty games, very dirty games to get what we want, which is we want regime change in Russia. We've been referring to Putin as if he is Russia. If you look at all the news stories, they, are, they don't even bother to say Russia. They say Putin as if he is Russia, but that's not quite the case. He has tensions from within, too. He has much pressure. There are factions in Russia. I know about that, and I think people underestimate the, the degree of difficulty in ruling a country as big as Russia. If Putin does not act in certain ways, they will, they will take him down. People will not abide by it if the Russians are embarrassed in, the, in Donbass. They will not. And I think America doesn't understand that. They think that Putin makes up all these decisions himself. He sits there and he's like a, a king, a monarch, but he's not. He works with people. He has pressures. We have to understand that. Time for a break. Uh, and we'll be back. In Support comes from USC Online, providing exceptional graduate programs, certificates, seminars, and upskilling for current and aspiring professionals. Earn your graduate degree in a flexible online format from University of Southern California and learn from faculty at the top of their fields in areas such as business, health, law, engineering, psychology, communications, and more. Explore your options today at online.usc.edu. This is Bob Carlson of the Unfictional Podcast. The new episode is called The Lowrider. Impala's trademark is their three tail lights. Look at how sexy they look. Nice, yeah. beautiful, they stick out, nice and round, perfect. Let's take a step back and you just gaze into her eyes, really. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if I've mentioned this, but uh, I named my car, her name is Eileen. Take a cruise with Ernie on a brand new episode of Unfictional. It's out now, wherever you listen to podcasts. A few minutes. We're back with Sheer Intelligence and our guest. Well, I think the, it really goes back to a basic arrogance, which you as a young person had to confront. I mean, after all, you volunteered for combat in Vietnam. You'd been a school teacher there after you left Yale and, you know, and then before you went back and then you left again. Uh, but the story of your life 
is really uh, going between a notion of American uh, innocence and virtue and then being a soldier out there and seeing the killing of, of innocent people elsewhere, what Martin Luther King, we, here we are in Black History Month, we had just celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday. And most people, and certainly young people, would, and you never hear it mentioned, that Martin Luther King condemned the United States at the time of his death and, and before that as the major purveyor of violence in the world today. The major purveyor of violence in the world today, his government, the United States. Now, what we had with Gorbachev, the reason I say we like Putin, because Putin was not with Gorbachev, he was with Yeltsin, and Gorbachev was the naive one. And Reagan promised Gorbachev that NATO would not expand. The whole reason of NATO was supposed to be a Cold War organization. Gorbachev thought he was ending the Cold War. He was very proud of this, and, and Reagan seemed to accept that. And instead, this Cold War organization of NATO has grown. It's unwieldy because it includes Turkey, it includes you know all kinds of countries that you would suddenly find you're not in agreement with, and a couple of them are closer uh, to Russia in this respect. And you know it's hard to you know uh, organize you know it's like uh, organizing uh, cats or something. But the fact of the matter is, NATO was no longer supposed to be this vital organizing. What happened to the UN and the joint Russia Chinese statement? Even though the Chinese had bad experience with the UN and the Korean War, they fought UN troops, you know, uh, and so forth. Nonetheless, in that joint statement that Putin and Xi signed, they say, what happened to the UN? What is this NATO thing? What is this Western military alliance that is coming to our door? I think that's the big issue of our time. And unfortunately, it's only older people seem to have any memory of what the Cold War was supposed to be about and, and, and how it's, what's, what is it doing now? <laughs> You're very funny, Bob. Yes, it's great. You have a lot of passion. I think NATO, it's, as you say, has taken the place of the UN in many people's minds, but it shouldn't because it's an alliance of, with people from the West who, have, who seem to have one interest, one blinkered interest in taking over, in changing things. In Libya, as I said earlier, in Iraq, and they went to Afghanistan. They are interfering everywhere in the world. And Russia is, and China both recognize that and are worried about it. And it's a destabilization that we keep putting out into the world. It's what I call a strategy of tension. The, the concept, for example, of saying in our media, day by day, since I think it's since October, it's been a crescendo of the imminent invasion of Ukraine by the Russians. Russian invasion, invasion. The word invasion. This is not an accurate word. The Russia was not interested in invading Ukraine at all. What they are interested in doing is protecting the people of Donbass. That's where this thing comes. When the Crimea was uh, the Crimean situation, if you look at my at the film I worked on, Ukraine on Fire, it's very interesting. You see the people of Crimea at the hottest moment of the crisis, and you know what was happening. The, the nationalists, the, the, the Nazi groups were coming into Ukraine, into Crimea in order to cause trouble. And they saw them coming and they cut them off at the roads. We show it in the, we show it how, how, how uh, acute, how, how uh, perceptive the Crimeans were. They knew who the enemy was. They stopped them from coming into Crimea. And you know what the Ukrainian army that was stationed in Crimea did? The United States never tells you this in the press. They stayed in their barracks. They stayed in their barracks in Crimea. There was no violence at all. Not one person was killed. There was no gunfire. Crimea went into the referendum at peace. And the referendum, as you know, to rejoin Russia carried by a huge amount, by 90, some, 97, 80%. So uh, why was there no violence? If it, it was an unhappy situation. And these people truly wanted to join the Ukraine. Why was there no violence? That is a very interesting point, and people don't recognize. Same thing is true about Donbass. People don't recognize the, the murders that happened in Donbass, and the artillery and the shelling, and the Ukrainian army moving in. The whole situation last year. The, the only reason the Russian invasion it was been hyped by the Western press is because the Ukrainian army upped its troop numbers and its armaments on the border of Donbass. 
So it looked like they were about to make a move on Donbass. They were getting javelin missiles from the United States. They were getting other weapons and they were adding soldiers. They were trained by American advisors who were there. American, uh, all kinds of specialists are in the country. Uh, Green Berets, uh, uh, special forces. Uh, uh, it's an operation. The United States has put more, has put heavy amount of investment of our energy and time into destabilizing Donbass. And that was supposed to be the move, I think. And I think it's still a possibility. There was supposed to be a move in the winter, this winter, into uh, Donbass. If they had done that, think about it, uh, they would have been. That's why the Russian troops were brought. Actually, the Russian troops were not brought to the border. That's another lie. The Russian troops were where they are, in their barracks, close to the border, but not on the border. So when, uh, follow my thinking here, when, when William Burns, the CIA chief, goes to Europe in October, he takes with him these satellite photographs, which he shows to the Europeans in the, in the, in the belief that they would follow us in our plan. Uh, the satellite photos were, were completely false. They were, again, they transposed the satellite photos to look as if they were on the border of Ukraine. And that was the aggression charge that the Russian troops were about to invade. And it, which is, was just simply not true. They were in their barracks. They were in their station, their bases in, in Russia at that point. So uh, you have this buildup of a fake invasion, a fake, a false flag invasion. And that you keep hearing that. That's what concerns me. So think about it. If the Ukrainians go in, oh, that's another thing they said. They said there's a, there was, a, the Russians are planning a false flag operation in Ukraine was to show that the uh, Ukrainians are moving into Donbass to show all the destruction. And that will be uh, the reason for the uh, Russian, for the Russian, in, quote, invasion. Okay, so they, this is all staged. This is all staged, like an action in, frankly, in Syria. We did this several times in Syria to blame the Russians on ga for gas, using poison gas. Same thing is true in Ukraine. They were looking... The reason the United States put that information out there that the Russians were creating a false flag and were going to invade was because we were going to do it. We were going to support the, uh, the uh, nationalists to go into Donbass to attack the separatists. And if that had been the case, then Russia would have reacted. But we were, we were preparing the world to condemn Russia for that. We were preparing the world through our propaganda, which was extensive and worldwide, that Russia was the bad guy for having uh, come in to uh, try to defend the Donbass people. It was a very disgusting but typical CIA operation, typical of them, to put, in other words, they did the same thing numerous times now. They keep doing it. It's annoying because people don't see the pattern. They did it with Julian Assange. They're doing it with, they create these flags that they are doing, and they say he did it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, I understand it all too well. And and uh, I do want to bring up another a, a book that you wrote. I forget your co-author, but he was a well-known historian on the history of the Cold War. Uh, well, get, help me here. <laughs> the, uh, the, hello? Oh, Peter Kuznick. Yeah. And, and what is so interesting, I mean, look, you know, we're older guys. I'm older than you. Uh, but the fact of the matter is um, the notion of American innocence and exceptionalism has reasserted itself. And once again, with the Democrats, they're much better at this than the Republicans. The Republicans seem out for markets and business and so forth. The Democrats always have this fake idealism. And and uh, and what you documented in, in that book was a history of false flag operations. That's what on both sides. I, I want to reiterate this. I had hoped at this point in our history that nationalism would have receded, that people would not be dying over nationalism. And, and nationalism is always betrayed until some big emperor comes up and then they say, we're not nationalists, we're civilization. But I mean, the Kurds didn't get anything from U.S. manipulation of the Kurds in, in Iraq and 
Syria. They're not getting a, a state. And nationalism was played with in the old Yugoslavia. And, and where is the benefit there? Where is the benefit in Iraq? So in the name of nationalism, whether we, you know, yeah, well, now we claim we care about the Ukrainians. Do we really? Yeah. Does the U.S. really care about the, I, you know, it's interesting. My own, the only reason I'm in the United States, or at least part of me, is my mother was a refugee from the Russian Revolution. She left after the revolution. She was a Lithuanian. And you know what? She trusted the, the Russian communists more than she did the Lith Lithuanian nationalists or the Ukrainian nationalists to care about the Jews, because wow. they certainly didn't care about the Jews before. And a very significant number of concentration camp guards and everything were wow. drawn from the anti-Soviet nationalists in the Ukraine, in the, you know, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and, and so forth. And, and so nationalism is always played. You'll always find virtue on different sides. And I'm not here to celebrate Putin or Xi's Chinese national or anything else. I thought nationalism would decline. But as I see it, the main force in the world stoking nationalist preoccupation is the United States. Right. They are the ones saying, you know, we are not nationalists. We represent civilization, democracy, and freedom. But we're going to back, you know, <laughs> we're going to back the Shias against the Sunnis because we think they'll be better. Well, they weren't better, and they also happen to be close to Iran. But we're going to back this faction against that faction. ISIS, too. Yeah, and nothing has to do with really giving voice to people, giving voice to their concerns. There are just pawns. And and I think, you know, we're, we should really talk about the Democrats a little bit because we drank from this Kool-Aid that somehow if we could just get these enlightened Democrats back in, uh, you know, we'd be in better shape. Well, the enlightened Democrats gave us the Vietnam War that you, Oliver Stone, uh, got a Purple Heart and a Bronze Star for, you know, and, and saw what folly that war was. That was a Democrat war. And then they went out to, you know, with the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover, well, with the support of, of, of Lyndon Johnson to get Martin Luther King to kill himself because, you know, he dared oppose that war and said it was wrong, you know, so he was going to be expendable. As long as we're in, in Black History Month, let, let's bring that up. But the fact of the matter is, there's been no accountability. And the people who claim they are wise and believe in peace and democracy, no, they're quite cynical. And to take somebody like Victoria Nuland, who was involved in the machinations that overthrew a Ukrainian leader who happened to get along with Russia, that was his crime. Uh, you know, he had other crimes, the kleptocracy or what have you. That wasn't why he was overthrown. And the whole meddling and the assumption that somehow you are on the side of virtue because you are the United States, you've lived your whole life with that, Oliver. You carried a gun for that, that oh, hypocrisy. I know. I know. And uh, listen, you, the behavior of the United States in, in all these instances that you mentioned has been reprehensible. And it, it's hard for me to say it, but it's our country, Bob. And we, we continue to, to question it for these reasons. And it seems that we keep going in this direction. It's a, we're really blundering, blundering into a possible disaster. I'm talking about World War I level where because of our naivete, you know, they always say God protects uh, puppies and innocent people in, in the United States of America. But uh, I mean, it's just we're blundering in a bad way. We're not naive. What, what, what are you talking about? The, the people may be uh, caught up in what Huxley, the other dystopian uh, writer, uh, you know, in consumerism, and they don't give a damn about the world and they don't understand it very well. But our leaders are not naive. They're cynical. They're deeply cynical. They know there was no Russia gate, and and they know this is all machinations and everything. And and, and they're not interested. I, you know, I don't think for a second. I mean, Biden supported every irrational war. I don't think for a second uh, he has a greater compassion about the needs of people around the world than Republican hawks. I mean, the, what, the neocons, they started out as Democrats, then they became Republicans, then they became Democrats again. And they're the same people in the State Department, and what they like is mischief. They think it's virtuous. 
and it has to do with their careers. It has to do with power. And I know it's not naive. They know darn well uh, they're, they're not building a democracy there. And by the way, if you want peace and you want democracy, you got to go against nationalism. You got to contain it. And that's true for Putin as well. You know, uh, Putin, if Putin keeps stoking nationalist feelings, he, you know, that's going to destroy Russia. And the, the, I must say, I thought this joint statement of the Chinese and the Russians was a game changer, because what they really said is if we keep going down, the world goes down that road of nationalist division and stoking them and inventing them, you're going to have disaster. And that's what we're talking about now. We're talking about making not only Russia, but China an enemy. You know, when the fact is the Chinese and the Russians would like to because they're conservative, basically, the Putin leadership, they want to follow the Chinese model. They want to produce stuff. They want to be in this market global economy. Right. And, and that's a vision based on trade, based on producing things that one would hope would represent progress. Instead, we're back in the darkest days of the Cold War because there's a military industrial complex. There are careerists and they want war. They live off war. I can guarantee you that Mr. Putin is not at all interested in nationalism. He doesn't see nationalism the way you're seeing it. He sees national interests for Russia. And those interests are obviously in the sphere of that area around Russia, which is right. being and violated constantly by air, 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 uh, air exercises and, and land exercises, gigantic operations in the north and in the, and, and in the Black Sea of, of uh, Western allies to, to warn Russia not to invade. The word invasion was, was unbelievable. In my lifetime, I remember Vietnam and I remember the New York Times writing about how dangerous Vietnam was because of the communists. But I'd, I've never seen the word invasion every day in the New York Times. Russian aggression, invasion. They hit it like an Orwellian propaganda word and they use it over and over again. So that when, if there comes to be a fight, you will automatically register Russian invasion. That will be the first reaction rather than Ukrainian invasion of Donbass. It's a very sick game, and it's not mystical. It's called it's called it's called the great game. It's it's what they these people do for a life, for a living. They play the great game. They they raise the strategic tension and wherever they can, the pot boils, and they take advantage of it. Well, I I agree with that. The point I was trying to make about nationalism is that there, this will always be a force in the world. People find reasons to celebrate their own interests, their own culture, and attack others. The, the point of wisdom is to try to see past that and to try to find common interests. And I do want to say, I, I want to end this by talking about your Putin interviews, because I hope anyone listening to this will, will watch that Showtime uh, four-part series or will get the book based on it. And full disclosure, by the way, I wrote an introduction to your book. You might not remember. Yeah. Uh, I did. Uh, but I want to say, how if, if we are thinking about war here, and what does this guy Putin want? Uh, people ask me that all the time. You would at least have the obligation to take this work that you did, where you engage this guy, and it's absolute bull to say you don't ask tough questions, and that's a lot of crap, you know. It was, these were very good interviews, you know, I mean, I, and to put somebody, this Ma Masha Gessen, who now writes for the New Yorker, and is in the Ukraine, kind of stalking, stoking this whole thing, for the New York Times to, to, to really uh, dare I say it, just, you know, pee on your work. And I mean, it was just awful, you know, and, and not, by the way, telling. There was no great revelation there. Uh, but the idea that we don't have to, like reading this declaration, any serious person should read the Chinese-Russia declaration. You may disagree with all of it, but you got to read it, 5,000 words. What are they talking about? How did these two very different countries, which, by the way, had racial tests, historically didn't get along even in the heyday of communism were shooting at each other I happened to go from Russia to China I was there during the Cultural Revolution I know how they were at their border and everything else I was in Vietnam as well uh, you know so uh, somehow or other they're alarmed about us 
They're alarmed about American hegemony. And, you know, one is a communist country, China still. One is an anti-communist country, Russia. I don't think there's any question. Putin does not want a return of any kind of communist state of any sort. And, and yet... This, this is a cry for reason, this statement saying, what are you guys doing? What is this Western alliance? Do you think, still think you can control the world and not pay attention to what we're, we're concerned about? And it's not going to work for that reason. You can't blackmail them now. You know? Well, they, it, it, the, uh, yeah, thank God. But, but, you know, objectively speaking, the United States, think about it, is just more secure from external danger than at any time since before World War I. It has, we don't have any enemies capable or desirable of using military force against us, our territory, and its core interests. You know, China is not Japan, and Russia is not uh, Germany in those years. Yeah, but Russia still has a very formidable nuclear force. And and what one of the things, I remember I wrote a book called With Enough Shovels about Reagan's, the delusion during the Reagan administration about winning a nuclear war and our indifference to something Putin talks a lot about in your interviews, yeah. the need for arms control, the need for stability. That concerns the Chinese as well. And this, all this Victoria Newland stuff and all this, you know, let's bait them, let's bait them, let's stick our, eye, our finger in the eye of the Russian bear, all that ignores okay. the element of irrationality. You brought up the missile crisis. And what John Kennedy learned was, hey, it can all go kaput in a matter of minutes. Yeah. And that's the world we're playing with now. And that's why I bring up other people's nationalism and the pressure from there community. Don't forget, it was Khrushchev who was a Ukrainian that gave Crimea supposedly to the Ukrainian state, which was like, you know, giving, taking something from New Jersey and giving it to New York. They were supposed to be part of the same country. It was Stalin who was a Georgian, right, who, who thought Georgia should be incorporated in, in the greater Russia. Uh, you know, so we just, look, I was in the Ukraine, you know, because a, a year after Chernobyl, I was at the plant, and I could not for the life of me tell who was Russian and who was Ukrainian, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and they had joint responsibility for creating and for, for mishandling this mess, okay? Yeah. And, and, you know, it wasn't like, oh, they're the good guys over there. They're actually more born in Kiev and not near the Russian, but it was all garbage. They were all talking Russian. They all uh, had the same power structure that they were part of. And, and, and so, yes, it is largely an invention. But what I'm saying is, and uh, again, let me make, let this be a positive part of this interview. And I want to end by talking about Alexander, because I think it's one of your great works. Okay. And it applies here. Because Alexander was the idea that maybe there could be a good emperor, yes. but there can't be. Yes. It's a contradiction in terms. You can be enlightened with the best of Greek philosophy. Um, you can have the best intentions. You can have the widest open eyes. But at the end of the day, whether you're the Roman Empire, whether you're Alexander, or whether you're the U.S. Uh, hegemony over the world, your stated intentions have nothing to do with your capacity to contain evil. It's just the opposite. And that was the message from Orwell, who invoking about the use of the enemy, and we ought to take it seriously. I agree. I think so. Very well said, Bob. All right. Well, thanks for doing this, Oliver. And again, can they still see the Showtime interview with, on Putin? Is it still up there? You can go to Amazon, uh, you know, just regular Amazon, and you can, you can rent it there. It's oh, available. I'm sure you could rent it on iTunes and all the the other other platforms. It's on okay. Showtime also, but some people don't have Showtime. It's definitely widely available. All right. The Putin interviews, and it's a dozen interviews done over a two-year period, and I defy anybody to watch that. I watched it very carefully before I wrote the, an intro to, all of, to the print version of this, you know, very carefully. I think I watched it six or seven times before I wrote a word there. I think it's a marvelous piece of journalism. Uh, I really do. I think it's a very important insight into a guy who, whether you like it or not, has power, has to be dealt with, has to be dealt with seriously. You know, it doesn't mean you cave or you give in or nothing matters. But the fact of the matter is, you won't be able to just dismiss 
Putin, uh, in some simplistic terms, if you watch this movie openly. So let's leave it at that. That's this edition, this, uh, for this edition of Sheer Intelligence. Christopher Ho Postes at KCRW. Joshua Shear is our executive producer. Tasha Hakimi Zapata, who does the introduction. And the JWK Foundation, which in memory of a great journalist, Gene Stein, helps fund uh, the work of our podcast. See you next week with another edition of Sheer Intelligence. Sheer Intelligence.